So I'm going over why it's important to learn microeconomic theory. Why is this such a foundational part of every single economics major all over the country? Um, and my basic argument here is going to be that you can't make good decisions involving data if you don't um, understand microeconomic theory. That you'll use this in most decision making, making processes that use data. And I'm going to go through a couple of examples, one from a policy that was discussed on This American Life, another from Shark Tank. And But first, let me just briefly go through this model. I have um, other videos that explain the model in more detail, but this is just a basic classic benefit minus cost model. And basically, any decision where there's benefits and costs, where you're weighing a list of things that are good and bad about doing more of something, most of those can fit into this framework. And it captures the idea of diminishing marginal benefit and increasing marginal cost. And really, it, it tries, um, when we use this to make decisions, we're really going to be thinking about which one of these is more powerful, the diminishing marginal benefit part or the increasing marginal cost part. And just to remind you, um, if we're going to maximize benefit minus cost, we want to be at the largest bulge in this model, which happens, um, which happens about here. If we reach this point, our benefit minus cost is going to be zero. So this is the basic framework in economic theory. And the first example I want to talk about is This American Life had an episode, it was episode 555, where they talked about paying criminals not to do crime. And someone had heard in Richmond, California, that most violent crime, I think it was most shooting or something like that, was due to 17 or 19 people or something like that. So what the city decided to do was they went out and they spent resources trying to figure out who are those 17 people. And they identified 25 people and brought them in and paid them a big sum of money to join this program. And the program followed them over a number of years where it basically gave them resources to get their lives put back together. It helped them get their GED, helped them get jobs, helped them get a driver's license, all of those things that you need to function in society. And based on that program, they saw an 80% reduction in violent crime. So that is incredible. So the big question is, um, how much should the government invest in expanding this program for Richmond? And if we think about this, um, we're given some data. What is the benefit of the program? The benefit is the reduction in crime. That's the 80% reduction in crime. The cost, and that's our, our data, is the cost for 25 criminals. And our, our decision is going to be, it could be dollars invested, or it could be, um, say, number of criminals to enroll um, is going to be the one we're going to use. And the benefit is the reduction in crime. The cost is the cost per enrollee. And what we have to keep in mind when we're looking at real world data like that is that we don't actually know where on this spectrum we are. The fact that benefit outweighs cost means that the um, marginal benefit, which is given by the slope, is greater than the marginal cost. Certainly, we believe that whatever money we invested per criminal was definitely worth the 80% reduction in violent crimes. So we know these two outweigh each other. But what we cannot do is assume that the benefit and cost will stay the same as we enroll more and more criminals in the program. If, if this were to stay the same, then we should invest infinite dollars in the program because we can see our benefit minus cost would be infinite if these data trends continue exactly like they are. But we know that these data trends will not continue like they are. So the question we actually have to ask ourselves after we look at the data, we know we're somewhere below this point. We know we want to invest more in the program because um, the benefit per dollar invested is so high but we don't know how much more, and that's the big decision. So to think about that, we need to figure out which one is going to happen faster. Is there going to be a faster dr drop in the marginal benefit or a faster increase in the marginal cost? And of course, there's arguments both ways. To, to go out and find new criminals to 
um, or new potential criminals to enroll in the program might be more expensive, might be harder. Um, you might have to knock on more doors. <coughs> you might, the police might actually have difficulty finding more criminals to, um, to enroll in the program, in which case you could have a very quick increase in the marginal cost. That's not what I think is going to happen. What I think would happen is um, you've already got the, the most likely criminals in the first 25 that you took through the program. So who are you going to invite in the program next? You're going to invite people who might become criminals or people who um, have a history of crime but not violent crime and you think they might turn to violent crime. So, so as you invite more and more people into the program, the marginal benefit decreases because these are people who are less and less likely to um, engage in violent crime anyway. So my guess is that the benefit, the diminishing marginal benefit portion of this is what is going to drive your decision. But as you can see, the data alone will not tell you how, when you should stop. The data alone will tell you invest infinitely. It's only through this framework that we realize there won't need to be infinite investment. Um, okay, so that's example number one. Example number two is very similar. It's from Shark Tank. And I mean, I have an episode in mind, but I'm not even going to say it because this, this basic setup applies to many, many Shark Tank episodes. Um, in Shark Tank, you have these startup companies and the companies, um, they have this great idea for a product. They're starting to produce the product. They have some data on the product and they want money from investors to get their business going and growing. And so the typical data they might give you might be, um, it costs us $30 in materials to produce the product, but we sell it for $150. Isn't that great? Um, and then the sharks kind of poke them a little bit and they'll eventually ask, what's your cost of acquiring a new customer? And they're super impressed if the business owners know that it costs $12.50 to acquire a new customer. And they've gathered that data by, um, advertising on Facebook or advertising on Google and looking at the number of new customers versus the amount of advertising and they came up with this number. So here we actually have two portions to our cost. We have the cost of materials and the cost of acquiring the customers. And we have the selling price of the product. So this is our benefit. And we want to maximize revenue minus cost. So we have our benefit and our cost. And of course, this data tells you you're making a killing per product. Um, you're making $150 minus 30 minus 1250. That is just a lot of money per product. So if you take the data at face value, you know that benefit certainly outweighs cost right now. If you don't take into account economic theory, which says these numbers eventually, the marginal benefit and marginal cost, eventually are going to change, and that's going to drive that change is going to drive your decision. If you don't think about that, the optimal investment is infinite. And we all know that's not reality. So we have to look at these three factors and figure out which one is going to change the quickest. And if we looked at, at the raw materials for most of these, it's usually plastic, maybe some fabric. Um, it's very simple materials. And the price of those materials probably isn't going to change. So this is actually probably a fairly linear part of the cost curve. <clears throat> The selling price, um, that one might change as we get more and more customers. We might sort of get all the customers who are willing to pay 150 and we might need to lower the price. So this one could be a potential driver for, um, for making our, our decision on how much to invest. How quickly have we used up all the $150 people and how quickly do we need to lower that price? That's one key factor for thinking about economic theory. Um, but this one, I'm guessing, is going to be a really, really major factor, the cost of acquiring a new customer. So we've advertised on Facebook. We've advertised in sort of the obvious places. And if you go to the obvious places, you get the cheapest customers. Um, that's why this $12.50 piece is them going to the obvious advertisers and getting the customers who are most willing to click and, and go look at the product. How do you get all those other customers who never click on advertisements? How do you get the customers who don't use the internet or, or don't um, notice things on the internet as much? That's going to be much, much more expensive. The same marketing strategy will not reach those other customers. So this one, this part of the cost curve is definitely going to be on a, on a part that's increasing at a pretty rapid pace. 
And these changes in the marginal cost and marginal benefit, these changes are actually what make your decision, not the data itself. So I hope you found this to be a convincing argument why you really do need microeconomic theory if you plan to be a good decision maker.